Hello. Welcome to session 2B. Is anybody there? The impact of transformed archival work and educational opportunities. I am Shiraz Bathina, and I am a member of the MAC 2021 Programming Committee. Before I turn over to our session presenters, I would like to go over a few logistical details. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available for viewing in approximately two weeks. Please use the Zoom Q&A feature to submit your questions. The session also has the chat feature enabled, which you are free to use to make comments or share relevant information with your colleagues, but try to direct your questions to the Q&A so they will not be missed. I would also like to share Mac's expectations for conduct during this session. Um, that's in the chat. By participating in this session, you agree to engage respectfully with the presenter and other session participants. Any type of harassing or disruptive behavior is prohibited, including but not limited to abusive or derogatory comments, slurs or epithets, threats or acts of violence, intimidation, misgendering, or any excessive comments not pertinent to the topic at hand. We will be monitoring the chat throughout the webinar, and if anyone engages in harassing or disruptive behavior, that person will be removed. Thank you for following these guidelines. Finally, you are welcome and encouraged to, to share your conference experiences via social media. I will be adding to the chat the suggested conference hashtags. Thank you. And now I will turn it over to Megan. Thank you. I just need to share my screen, one moment. All right, good afternoon. I'm Megan Badgley Malone, and I wanna welcome you to, is anybody there? The impact of transformed archival work and educational opportunities during COVID-19. We have three presenters today. Melinda Isler is the university archivist slash special collections librarian at Ferris State University. She has a master's in library and information science in public history from the University at Albany, part of the State University of New York system. She's also a certified archivist. Melinda has been at Ferris State University in Big Rapids, Michigan since 2002. Her responsibilities include managing the university archives, which collects regional history in addition to the university materials. She also coordinates the records management program. Marion Maiden is an associate professor in Central Michigan University Libraries and archivist of the Clark Historical Library. She earned a BA and MILS from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor and an MA in history from CMU. One of Marion's favorite parts of being an archivist is helping students learn about primary sources, how to process and describe them, and discover whether or not they want to become archivists. Finally, we have Katie Higley. Katie is a sophomore at Central Michigan University studying public history, museum studies, anthropology, and cinema studies. At CMU, she is a McNair scholar currently studying how Michigan museums are utilizing their film collections. She's interested in film preservation and how films can be a valuable teaching tool in museums. And now I'll turn it over to Melinda. So the title of my presentation today is In the Archives, We Should, dot, 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 but I. So this is a picture of the building that I work in. This is the alumni building, the oldest existing building on Fair State campus. If you look at that big tree on the left-hand side, my office is right behind it. Um, so I can spy on what the students are doing outside. So you can go on to the next slide. So a lot of times when I go to these conferences, physically or, or online, um, I hear all these great projects and I always go, I would like to do that, but, and the but has a lot to do with being a lone arranger with not enough resources, not enough staff, not enough technology, um, and a whole bunch of buts. But my presentation today is not so much about that. My presentation is about the advantages of being small in the time of the pandemic. So you have a nice shot here of, um, one of my courts, I have racquetball courts that were converted into archival storage space. I wanna be clear, there's no climate control, but I will point out that I actually have a vent in the top of the roof that I can get fresh air into there that's nowhere else in the building, which is really critical in this time. Um, I'm going to talk about the spaces that we are using. 
the people that we're using, the projects, a little bit about what we obviously can't do and how we can use some of what we've learned during this time and going forward as we are at least as far as we know, supposed to be back to fully like we were in the fall of 2019 um, and not having primarily online classes. Forward, please. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of background about what I manage. So I manage myself since I'm the only employee. While I report to the library, I'm physically about four blocks away from the library. I have sometimes two students, sometimes three, sometimes five students. This year I had an extra student funded by a grant. So it was a little bit more. I managed archive storage spaces and an active record center and archives reading room and the student workspaces. Um, I have an example of a bunch of display cases around campus. This is in our main university center building. It is used, um, they have a history corner. And so there are things that were taken off of older buildings that were put up some date stones and things and I have a display case. I have about 9,500 feet of records that are archival records. I also manage records management. So I have about 1948 and I had to count that because I just destroyed some stuff last week. I destroy about 100 to 125 boxes a year and process the records destruction approval process for Ferris. I also have server space and I'm also mid-grant, as I mentioned earlier, we are combining our DSpace institutional repository and our digital asset management system, which previously held photographs, but didn't let the public view them unless they got a specific link into a single publicly available system through a list of grant. Next slide. So a large part of what I'm doing in a lot of my slides are pictures because it's hard to explain and I think it's easier to just show you. So you can see the other side of the tree now. Um, this is the archivist office space area. Again, you will notice that this is an old building which doesn't have climate controlled storage and heating, but it does have a whole lot of windows and windows that can actually be opened. And so the airflow issue that a lot of buildings, including our main library had was not so much of an issue for me. Um, if I was worried about it, I opened up a window. In fact, in the spring when my spouse was teaching from home, he was uncomfortable going into the arts and sciences building and we had such poor internet that we would come in at night into this building and let him upload it here because he felt more comfortable about the uh, airflow space in my space. So that's the archivist work area. We're gonna talk a little bit and show you all the other work areas as well, including our scanning area, our student workspace, our reading room, and what I call the back room. So if you go forward. So here's our reading room. It's got two views, one looking out towards the courtyard area and one looking back, which has sort of the collection. You can see again, lots of windows. Um, if you look at the slide on the right, you can see I have these four large tables. Um, when we were measuring out spaces to see who could come back when, um, you can only fit one person at each of these tables. In many places around campus, they have everything mapped off, mapped out, but because I have so little in-person traffic, it was not necessary. If someone comes in, I just say, you sit in this seat and that worked. And I didn't have somewhere to store extra chairs. So if you wanna go forward, so that little cubicle at the end, you can see how it's a workspace that used to be, I used to have a staff member working for me before she retired a few years ago. And so that's a space where they can watch the reading room and do things at the same time. On the other side, if you kept going down the hallway, you can see that's a room that was originally designed as a display space. It is largely used as a workspace. We have two large tables set up in there um, and they are six feet apart. So that is a space where my students work and it's where we often work with doing the initial listing work of our accessions. So you can go forward. And this is another one of the cubicles. It's me and my two to four semester students each semester. I like to hire sophomores or freshmen because I like to keep them for a couple of years. Um, it, takes at least a semester to train them. So I pair them with an older student so that they can get the, oh yes, there's this, or oh no, that's where you're gonna find the display case things that you're gonna put into the display cases. 
Um, it's not something I like to retrain them through every semester. And they do deliveries for the archives. They actually do the initial listing. They scan photographs. They do much of the reference requests of, you know, my great grandmother was here in 1910 and they know the six different places they can look and where to scan and what to do. And so I could not run my operation without them. And I run it more slowly in the summer because they're not here. So you can go forward. Their work did not change really all that much. Um, in the spring, I tried to give them projects that they could work on, digital projects. We had a lot of things going into the institutional repository that needed to be made ADA compliant before they went live. But only two of my students had any internet access at all because they went back to their own rural areas, one in the UP, um, one out sort of near where you are, Marion, towards the, to the east. And so they couldn't manage those sorts of projects. So my goal was to get them back um, and do it in a safe manner. At Ferris, we had to fill out something called the re-engagement plan that went through the safety office, which is pretty familiar to me because I manage most of their records in the inactive record center. Um, so I pulled out my plan. I showed them where everyone was going to go. And I, I tried to have two students working at a time, but not all four at once, so that we minimized the people who were in there. Um, and they approved my plan to allow me to start going back to work in August. So we had a grant funded project where they were working approximately 18 hours a week. Um, that is unusual for my students. Usually they get between six and eight hours a week because that's all my budget can afford. So we had one student who was full time doing nothing but the grant funded scanning. I got a new scanner and desktop that you can see at the end of this photo and I already had another one and they are six feet apart. As I said, they frequently do reference. Our reference, even back in the pre-COVID days, I probably get non-Ferris, active Ferris people visitors is probably about 30 in a given year. So I don't get a lot of in-person traffic. It's usually remote and we send them what they're looking for. So they can work on those kinds of questions. However, again, because I don't have anything digitized, it was pretty much something I couldn't do from home even when my internet was cooperating because there was nothing scanned. Uh, we also manage acquisitions. I had a fun project in end of March when I got a call from someone who was the secretary to the Dean of the College of Education and Human Services, which in a reorganization was being shut down over the summer. She said, I'm retiring. She said, I need boxes now. And so she got me into the building and they had shut down the elevators. I don't know why. So I hauled up the two cases of boxes up there for her and she filled them up and the moving crew delivered them back to me in the summer. So when my students got back, they had to go through it, get rid of duplicates, compress it. And it went from 36 boxes down to 26, which are waiting to be brought downstairs to my storage area. So we have a lot of acquisitions work. They primarily do the box and file listing. I use archive space. Archive space was new to us. We just got it implemented in February of last year. So I haven't trained any of them on it yet. That's for next fall. So they generally give me the, full, the file and I just insert it in for the box and folder listing. We do records management. You can see we have a shred doc bin. So my students manage much of that. I get the destruction form approved. I have them pull it up from the inactive record center, which is also in the lower level of this complex. And then they have to shred. They have to get them all into the shred bins. So they were responsible for updating that display case photo that I had showed you earlier. We also provide boxes, not for people moving, but for people who are transferring stuff to our area. So they bring out tours. And so, and I think Marion's probably gonna mention this as part of her archival class, I did a virtual tour um, in which I took basically a camera, went around, uh, broke it into pieces because the file was way too large. Uh, so that they could actually see what the lower storage areas and all right, somewhat haunted places of my location are. So you can go forward. 
what we couldn't do. I don't want to say I could do everything the same as usual. We couldn't. We couldn't do in-person instruction. This is another shot of Marion's class in a time when they came here. And you can see why social distancing is not going to work in that space. We hold history events where we pass out buttons and we promote different things like the day old main burn down. Um, we do group tours. We used to be open five days a week, eight to five. We didn't get to do that this year because of archivist child care restraints. And as part of that child care restraint, my child is being picked up by my spouse who thankfully isn't teaching in the summer. Uh, so I had to sort of limit my hours and work from home in the later part of the day. And while we have a library van, we did chose not to use it for deliveries because A, parking was not nearly the issue that it usually is. Um, and B, it involved a whole lot of sanitation because we didn't know who would be in it before us or not. So I just said, just use your own vehicles. And if no one complains, we'll, we'll do that. My students don't pick up full boxes. We just deliver the empty boxes that aren't put together to them. So next slide. So my reflections on what can I still do or not do? Um, I find that my student workspace, except for that one place where I put two computers in the same thing, works pretty well. They're close, but, but they're not on top of each other. And it's still primarily a physically based job. I would have considered if it had worked allowing students to work some hours outside of uh, the archives, but since internet is apparently not a good thing in my area, it's not something we can really do. Our student workers prefer to have multiple projects. I should have rewritten the grant to make it part of two students' times because standing there scanning all day is, is tedious. Um, I have found that share drives like OneDrive are a great thing to get electronic files from other staff on campus who are now migrating to non-paper-based files. As people were retiring, they would, instead of bringing in a flash drive and saying, here, take it off of this, they would just put it into OneDrive. And as long as they did it before they retired, because our institution has this thing where two weeks after you leave, they delete it out of the system. It's worked really well for electronic acquisitions. Um, and I'm hoping, I like in-person meetings much better as a general rule, but I'm hoping that some of them I can participate in online because it allows me to be here more frequently when the students are here in case they have questions. So I would like to see how we could do that. And you can go to my last slide, which is basically my um, contact information. So that is my presentation and we will go to Marion. Marion, you're muted, just so you know. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Marion. I'm going to talk about tips and lessons I learned teaching and also having internships during COVID. And this first picture is me practicing in my new large state of the art room that I had to be moved to, which I'll, I'll talk about later. But you can see I'm kind of the monkey in the middle of this large state-of-the-art classroom. So this was going to quickly become my future. Next slide, please. So the first tip I have is acceptance. So early in March, um, I got a really distressing Facebook post from a cousin in Europe about how terrible the situation was. And uh, it was really bad. And so I realized a couple of things that campus lockdown was going to occur very quickly the impact would probably last at least a year, maybe longer, um, and that this was going to affect my classes, internships, where and how I taught and worked. And I saw this as a challenge to transform. Some people said it was an opportunity. I was so stressed, I just saw it as a challenge. But I realized I had to start now. Next slide, please. So tip number two was educate yourself. So I had taught for a long time, but I knew it would be different teaching online. And I knew there were people who were teaching online, that it wasn't something brand new. So what could I learn from them? So I highly uh, used and highly recommend Society of American Archivists Teaching with Primary Sources group. 
And at CMU, my college, Central Michigan, we have a unit called Career Instructional Services or Curriculum Instructional Services. And these people are fantastic, um, real po really positive. They know all the tips and tricks and they had a lot of really easy to understand videos that were logical. And so these were the two groups that I saw everything that they produced. What I learned was you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Everything you produce for online teaching or internships, you wanna have it evergreen so you can reuse it easily in the future. Long-term high stress physically affects everyone's brain and it prevents and or decreases learning ability. And that's both for students and for professors or teachers. It is very important to encourage a strong sense of community online and it's harder online and tech issues will happen. And I heard this in every single webinar and it did happen to me. And my mantra during COVID became adapt, adapt, adapt. Next slide, please. So to give you an idea, um, I went from classes like the one pictured on the left where I had many students in a small space jammed together for a project. They all worked on physically processing manuscripts from a lumber baron from the 19th century into the early 20th century. And it was going to become what you see on the right where I had a class of the same size and it would be um, all adapted to online. Next slide, please. So tip three, choose the best tech for your needs. Like we were talking right before the session, for me, Microsoft Teams worked. And what I found out that I didn't know is I had a friend who actually works for Microsoft. She shared two short videos with me. It was like uh, 25 easy steps with Microsoft and how Microsoft can be used for teaching. And I thought, wow, I, I'm, I can't waste time there's too much to do. I can't waste time looking at other systems. This one seems to do what I need, I'm going with it. It already had a successful record in education. I was able to post materials that, uh, so they would be evergreen. Very important to me, it had high potential for small group learning and community. And um, I'll tell you later, that didn't work quite as well as I had hoped, but it is improving year to year. Their videos were very intuitive. I don't think like a lot of software producers or um, coding people. So that was very important to me. The videos were quick and easy to follow. Using Teams is secure. Nobody drops in on you. That was a big problem at CMU with people dropping into classes and causing problems. I use Teams for everything, classes, meetings, internships, training, chat sessions, everything. Next slide, please. Tip number four, practice makes perfect. I practiced with friends and family and I had a friend and she was my quote unquote problem student. She tried to take control away from me. She tried to stop the session. She tried to interrupt. She took over the chat, everything that a problem student or somebody, you know, problematic might do. So I was prepared how to deal with that. It became very clear to me that I would need that new room. So I requested a new room. I did not have enough space in the Clark reading room to space everyone out. We could only fit seven people in the Clark and I already had 24 students. So I was given one of the most advanced tech classrooms on campus, which was like a massive leap forward for me. Um, to, to deal with this, I called in favors from my IT friends. So don't be afraid to do that. Next slide, please. So my new classroom was in a totally separate building. So I also could not take manuscript collections or materials in to demonstrate them in class like I normally would. And I should say my archives class is, um, both undergraduates and graduate students, okay? So it's like a general overview of everything you wanna know about archives. So I ended up in a separate room in a monkey in the middle teaching uh, area, which you see on the left, and with 10 large monitor screens 
four microphones hanging from the ceiling and several cameras with multiple views. And I had to learn how to deal with all that. Next slide, please. Tip number five, do what you can where and when you can. So I was at home from March until June. In July, we had to start going in so many days a week in 2020. So I used that time to educate myself about the system, about online teaching and training. I prioritized work to do at home and in the building. When I got in the building, all I did was stuff that I had to do only there. And I used all my um, uninterrupted time at home to review and transform materials and processes for online. Now, if you take anything from my presentation at all, take a picture of what's highlighted with your phone. My guiding question was what do students need to do to demonstrate to me they can apply what they learned in my class? What is absolutely necessary? Not what I like, not what I want, not what I'm used to, but what is necessary. And this has become my guiding principle. Next slide, please. So tip number six, if the student can't come to the archives, the archive somehow has to come to the student because my class is about archives. So some of the students were gonna have to rotate because they couldn't all fit in the classroom. So that meant everything had to be available online, even though this was a hybrid class. And CMU did not require students to be in the classroom so many days a week. They, they had uh, the ability to choose when and if they were gonna come in at all. So for my lectures, I usually have many, many primary sources, all different kinds of formats and materials and examples I share. So to save time, I went in with my cell phone and I took pictures of them. I had a list in advance. It was fast and easy. Um, and I wanted to show size and physicality and depth. So what I did was I took several photos of each item and I had either a ruler, my hand or a yardstick in the image so students could get some kind of an idea. Otherwise it's just like one picture, they're all the same size. So they could tell some of these things were just massive that I was taking pictures of. For student projects, they didn't have a box. So what I did was I took one unprocessed box of materials, I roughly, really super roughly organized folders, like folders of correspondence, folders of bills, folders of miscellaneous materials. And then one at a time using our photocopier scanner, I scanned the folders. So I ended up with like 14, 16 folders that were scanned and now they're digitized, rough digitized. And I used those and merged them different folders into different boxes. And I created multiple digital boxes. This was cheap, it was fast, and it was sufficient. And I had a plan B. So another tip is to always have a plan B. I have extensive family papers at home and I could have scanned those. So um, whatever was gonna work. I didn't know when I started planning this, if we were actually gonna be allowed back in the building before fall. Next uh, slide, please. Tip seven, block and chunk everything. Um, this decreases stress and makes it easier to learn, especially online. And from this point forward, anything that's highlighted in yellow is gonna be about decreasing stress and making it easier to learn. So for example, uh, for my lectures, uh, for my classes, what I would do is I would use Microsoft Team and then I would go share my lecture. My lecture structure was always the same. I always had a welcoming slide, a tech reminder slide, and an outline. Then the lecture organized by section or topic with a big break in the middle, and then a final wrap up slide. So next slide, please. So this is an example of my wrap up slide. Um, I wanna say my class was from 6.30 to 9.20 at night. So it's, it's exhausting. You need interesting things to look at to stay awake. And the image of CMU's campus from the 1970s, that image changed to go with each topic that we covered. So if we had a night where we talked about photographic materials, it would be some type of photographic material. So the wrap up was always kind of a reminder slide because at this point, everybody's exhausted. What of your homework is due and when? Um, I always tried to focus on hope 
um, positive on getting through COVID together and tried to bring, uh, have a statement that had something to do with the topic of the evening's discussion and lecture or the image on the right. And I always had my contact information and I always thank the students for being part of my class and wishing them money. Because at this point, they're probably gonna go home and either go to sleep or um, spend a couple hours doing homework. So it's a, a long day. Next slide, please. Tip number eight, communicate. Brief to the point directions. I thought I had brief to the point directions, but I found that there were still students who could not absorb the data. So I encourage everyone, make your directions even briefer, even more to the point. Um, engaging questions are really important for any online teaching or training. What do you think about, or what if, or what is your opinion about to really get people engaged instead of just saying, do you have any questions? Um, for positive ongoing communication, I responded to each student by name anytime they communicated with me, whether in class or emails. I only had 23 students. So if you have a class of 100 or multiple students going through with like one shot bibliographic construction, um, that, that's really hard. I mean, you can't learn all the students' names, but you can always say, um, you know, something like my dear student. So I had a, what I called my dear student Wednesday reminder after class on Tuesday night. And I would summarize um, where we were, what we were gonna do going forward, homework assignments, who was gonna present in a week, two weeks, three weeks. So they had those reminders. Next slide, please. Creating a sense of community. Um, so before class, my students could see me. Um, I would, we would chat um, in teams. Um, if it, like Halloween, I found Halloween emojis. I'm not big on emojis, but you know, something that they would connect with or, or laugh about. I also wanted to share like reacting um, positively to make a sense of community. So election night happened during my class. And when I was coming into the building, um, it was clear that it was a point of extreme high stress. Um, it was visible and audible. I had students crying in the hall on election night. So, and I'm not gonna make this political, I'm just saying this as an example. So what I did was we were not gonna be able to learn anything that night. So I started off by acknowledging that it was also kind of stressful for me, but I voted, I had said a prayer. I normally wouldn't share that, but I did that night and that I had to let it go. And um, then I offered like a very brief yoga breathing exercise that people could do seated. And you could literally hear everyone sit up and breathe with me. You could have heard a pin drop except for the breathing. And students um, really appreciated that. And it calmed us all down. It took the stress down a notch. Um, so something like that. You can't just pretend it's not happening. We also had the entire university server fail in our second class, right when we were going to switch to small group meetings. So everybody bonded over that. That was, those were two points of extreme high stress in the class. And I also wanted to discuss pet jeopardy as a coping means. Next slide, please. So um, I usually have my students divide up and offer study guide questions for every class. And um, I don't know, for a number of years I've done it kind of like I get their questions in advance and then kind of like a jeopardy game show I ask the questions and whoever wins gets some candy or uh, some kind of trinket or gift or something. And they usually enjoy this. It's more fun to learn that way. But we couldn't do that because there were, because we were in a digital hybrid class. So what I suggested was pet jeopardy. So with your questions, you would include a picture of your pet. So this is Freddie and Freddie is just like intoxicatingly cute, right? So everybody just thought this was wonderful. Everybody talked about their pets. There was lots of laughs, it decreased stress. For the students who didn't have pets, one was a bio, bio major who had pictures of plants with really cute names that went with the types of plants. And then I had one student who had no pet pictures at all. So I went into our historic uh, photographs and I found pictures of kids with pets and put those up. 
and they enjoyed that. I will definitely do this again. I might do this for a midterm uh, project too. Next slide, please. Um, adapting projects. So my projects for my class went from larger paper collections in the building to smaller digital boxes or collections that they did on their own time outside of class. That was kind of the high flux part of it. Like I would demonstrate and we would discuss and then they would do work on their own outside of class. And we went from visiting archives in person for research or like visiting um, Melinda's archives to have a tour and understand how different uh, various archives can be, how they're set up, how they function, what they do, to visiting and doing research um, of digital collections online and interacting with archivists like Megan and other MSU archivists as well online. Um, this was sufficient and it was less work and it decreased their stress and my stress. Maybe not Megan's and Melinda's, but everybody on my hands. Next slide, please. I also adapted all the assessments. So we went from paper, midterm and final in class during class time to online embedded in Blackboard, which is a system CMU uses. And the CIS staff embedded it in Blackboard for me. Um, I found out this was a, a great time saver for me and decreased my stress um, because I had the tests were true and false, uh, multiple choice, and short answer. The only thing I ended up having to grade myself was the short answer. I offered the midterm outside of class time in between two classes, which worked well, and I allowed the maximum time which was two hours for the midterm and for the final. And this decreased the student stress. I was under a lot of pressure from CMU to crunch all the exams down and also to use the lockdown browser. But what I found is if like a cat goes by and you look at the cat, the system tracks your eye and then flags you as possibly cheating on the, the assessment. So I just didn't wanna deal with that. Um, this worked so well that I'm definitely going to switch to having the homework embedded in Blackboard next year. So this year they had to like print it and then email it to me, but they have great stress worried about if their emails get to me. So I would suggest if you have an ability to do this, um, to, to do it. Next slide, please. Online internship training. So I just wanted to say the online internships were less stressful for the students than for me. Overall, that's what I've been hearing. I was really concerned about it, but it worked really well. It adapted well. And um, if you want more material on anything I'm talking about, just contact me and I'll share. So what I do the first day is I train. So everyone is minimally at the same level. Some of them may have prior experience, but there's a certain minimal level and an understanding of um, expectation and communication. I send them materials to read in advance and a form to sign. I chunk and block every bit of training. I also, if one question comes up from one person about anything, I share that question and my answer with everybody so we don't have to repeat. Also, um, like Melinda said, just coding or scanning all day is really boring. So I try to have other little projects they can do as well to break it up. And every Friday we have a meeting and I encourage and assign the students to come up with something fun to share about archives. It could be a news article, it could be a video of some sort, a topic we wanna to discuss, something interesting. Um, next slide. So here's an example of a video I found. This is from Disney about their research library. Now I've got undergraduates and graduates, not all of them are gonna become archivists. So this is bright, colorful, fun, which decreases stress. It's short. I like short videos. Um, and it appeals to broad interests and abilities. So if you're interested in film, if you're interested in objects, if you're just taking the archives class, um, but that's not what you're going to go into, there's a lot going on in this video. Next slide, please. Um, tip number 13 is start small. Again, this facilitates quick, easy learning, builds confidence and skills. It actually also stops a lot of problems before they can happen and decreases stress. So for example, on the first day for um, internship training, 
I'll start, um, you know, we chat a little bit and then I show them a finding aid and uh, the corresponding encoded archival description template that I use. And we start with a very small finding aid for a collection that's maybe 0.25 cubic feet, so tiny. And I've got it color coordinated. So the biography and the finding aid and the EAD say they're blue and the scope notes are both yellow. And then I demonstrate copying and pasting into the template in Teams um, so that the students can see how this works. Next slide, please. So then I have another small finding aid and I have for about an hour, I'll have the students copy and paste that into the EAD right on top of what was there. Then we'll meet about an hour later and we'll talk and discuss about their experience and we'll fix errors together. So then I'll give them a larger finding aid and have them repeat. So this gets into, um, into them how to do this and it's non-threatening and it's a learning experience that grows. And then usually about three o'clock we meet the first day and maybe wrap up, talk about what they're doing, some of the other little projects. So that's a good first day, everybody is exhausted. And then the next day I'll start them on a larger finding aid and they'll encode in sections, maybe just like the first couple of pages, then maybe one series of the box and folder listing and we meet, we check, we discuss. So by, you know, from a lot of meetings on day one, we go down to maybe one or two meetings the rest of that week. And by week three, we're usually down to one meeting only on Fridays. Next slide, please. And I'm almost done. What I wish had worked better in my class. So MS Teams for small groups didn't work uh, very well. Um, you had to have a student start a meeting. We were very stressed from the university server failure. So we decided just to drop it. That was being adaptive to the situation. It was just too stressful. But it's much easier. You can assign students to small groups and put them in it automatically and then bring them out of it. So I'm gonna try it again in fall. The Blackboard discussion boards were highly um, lauded. Um, I found them very time consuming and the completion rate was mixed amongst all the students. It's a good option for quieter students to feel comfortable expressing themselves, but I don't know if I'm gonna do that again. Next slide, please. Oh, and I wanted to say my internships worked great. Um, I, I, except for having more projects for them to do in the future, I, I thought those went really well. So I transformed everything. My class graded me a four out of four on the student opinion surveys. My internships, my interns learn skill, grad, will graduate on time and save them time and money instead of waiting for me to come up with things to do when we were in the building. And really importantly, I am valued just beyond the CMU libraries by the other programs and departments with these students. Last slide. So this is my email. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Uh, Katie, you're muted. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I am Katie. I am excited to be talking with you today about my digital internship experience with Marion and my experience taking her class and how I was still able to find value out of both of the experiences, even though they were virtual. Next slide, please. So a little background on my introduction to archives. So I started at CMU in fall 2019. I have an online education background, which I'll touch on more a little bit later. So I did high school completely online and I wasn't really sure about going to college. I was really nervous. And part of those nerves kind of ironically now was, was I going to be able to be successful at online classes in, in high school, but then be successful at traditional classes at college? And that was a big worry for me and I was really stressed out. And I also really didn't know what I wanted to do. I had always had a passion for history, especially film history. And one day one of my friends said, well, what about museums? And I went, yeah, that sounds like it would be like perfect for me. So I went into CMU knowing that I was gonna study public history and museum studies. And I call them added bonuses along the, 
freshman year, I found out that we also had cinema studies and anthropology, so I also studied those as well. So I discovered the Clark Historical Library's film project in January 2020. It was kind of a happy little accident. I had went to sign my cinema studies minor with my advisor, uh, Dr. Kevin Corbett, and he was very interested in why somebody who had a background in public history and museum studies would also want to be in cinema studies. So he started talking to me about this documentary called Dawson City Frozen Time, which is really interesting. I would highly recommend it. It's all about film preservation. And from that, he said, well, you know that the, the Clark Historical Library has a film preservation project as well. And I was like, no, I didn't. So I reached out to Marion and in a day or two, I went to the Clark and began training with a student volunteer, Katie Zawick. So I trained with her from January to March. And in that short period of time, I found that I loved what I was doing. And it really changed my career trajectory because now I know that I wanna be an audiovisual archivist. Um, next slide, please. So in March, 2020, the COVID lockdown happened. And I was sad that I couldn't continue to work on campus with um, channel 9 and 10, which is the film collection at the Clark that I work with. So I knew that I wanted to continue to work with 9 and 10 again as soon as it was safe to do so. I didn't realize at that time how soon that would actually be and how unique it would be because I was able to start a digital internship in June. So my internship was from June to August. It was all online. It was unpaid, but for class credit. This is a photo of me. This was something that was interesting to me because one of our things we have to do for for getting class credit is to share a photo and write a little bit about our experience. So I'm like, well, how do I share, you know, myself encoding? So this is how I did it. I just kind of set the computer in front of me with some encoding that I thought was interesting and, and took a photo that way. I also want to mention that for the Clark, for Channel 9 and 10, it has always relied heavily on volunteers and interns. So I had at that point worked with the collection a little bit. While I was training with Katie, I was more so watching her. So I had a little bit of knowledge, but not a ton. So this experience really allowed me to dive in to 9 and 10 and to really learn about what I had been physically processing and what I would continue to physically process later once it was safe again. So as Marion mentioned during her presentation, I was taught how to encode via Teams. And I really appreciated the way that she did that, where she broke it down and we were able to, myself and my fellow intern were able to come together at the same time, show our work, learn from each other's work and ask questions. And that was very beneficial. And it was a really simple learning process. When I first heard that I would be encoding, I was kind of nervous, but I realized very quickly that it wasn't as scary as I thought. I, you know, it got to the point where I could copy and paste something and like be watching a movie at the same time. Um, so that first week we also met a lot. We met multiple times a day, multiple times a week. And then it went down to one weekly meeting, but I still looked forward to those meetings because we had fun things to talk about. And we also were able to use the time to learn from each other. Next slide, please. So this was a very valuable experience for me. As I said, it really let me gain intimate knowledge of Channel 9 and 10. I found some really cool, interesting things within the description that I was reading. And that's one of my favorite parts about working with 9 and 10 now that I can physically process it again and actually watch it and write those descriptions myself is that I never know what I'm gonna find. So part of the class credit for this internship was also that I had to write a paper so while I wasn't encoding, I was like doing a ton of independent research and that also helped me get more familiar with archives in general, but especially with film collections. And one of the things that Marian encourages her students to do is to write a blog post for her blog that is shared. So I wrote that blog post and then I was able to take that blog post and get it published, which was a really big thing for me. And it's led to me being able to share my experiences at other conferences and share it on campus with other students who are kind of in the same boat where they're like, you know, I want to graduate on time, but really, but do I really want to do 
a virtual internship and I very openly share my experiences with them. And even though it was virtual, it strengthened my desire to become an audiovisual archivist. Next slide, please. So another thing this led to was becoming a McNair Scholar. So my interest in being a McNair Scholar in the project that I'm working on currently was really born out of the independent research I did during my internship. So what I'm working on now is exploring how film is being utilized in Michigan museums with the ultimate goal of an increase in preservation and use of these valuable primary sources. This is a picture um, from the Clark of a very interesting film we found that was wrapped in a garbage bag and then wrapped in tape. Thankfully, we were able to get it out with pretty minimal damage. Next slide, please. So History 583, I took it in the fall with Marion. I was kind of nervous to take it because I was still a sophomore and it was a 500 level class, but I felt pretty confident about it because of my experiences working with Marion in the past and the independent research that I had done during my internship. So it was a high flex model via Teams. And as I said earlier, I do have an online education background. So I feel like the transition for me was easier than it would be for a lot of students, but it is also very different for me because I had a lot of um, questions and expectations about how things were going to be done. So while I had done online education before, everyone was online. In this case, it was like some of us are online and some of us, you know, are there in person, which was very interesting. And I found that Teams was one of the platforms that my professors had used that I did prefer, but it definitely had some of its challenges. With Marion's class, we never really figured out how to do breakout rooms, but in another class we did, and I found that to be valuable. And I did ultimately like the way the team's breakout rooms did work because I was kind of, I was kind of worried about that because I didn't think that when I was in high school, the system we used worked well with breakout rooms, but I thought that teams did. So I chose to always attend class online. Part of this is because Marion had asked me if I would because I felt pretty comfortable doing things online and also because of that rotational issue. And this is a picture of me and the Clark with nine and 10. Next slide, please. So we had in and out of class discussions. So with Teams, you could pop on the speaker, you could get on your video, you could type in chat. I notice for me personally, I'm a very shy individual. So with these classes with the chat feature, I notice I'm asking questions and adding comments that if we were in person, I know I wouldn't add but the discussions didn't work perfectly. So as Marian said, the discussion boards were very hit and miss. I recommended them to her because we had done them in a very similar format in a couple of other online classes I had done and they had worked well, but it was, it was a very mixed bag. And I found in my other classes that were also doing discussion boards, it was the same thing, unfortunately. With Marian's class, I was also able to learn from graduate students, which was nice, especially as someone looking to go to grad school, being able to look at the work that they were doing during that class and what they had done was a very nice experience. And every class was a learning experience. We never really knew what was gonna happen. But the great thing about Marion is that she truly cares. She would ask me before and after every class, what went well, what ideas do you have? What can we change? And as a student, I really appreciated that. I felt like she cared and that she really wanted every student to have the same experience, but with less stress. Next slide, please. So we did have to process an, ar an archival box. That was also a continual learning process where I know there were days when I'd have like 10 questions, but then those 10 questions could be shared to the whole group and it ended up clearing a lot of the confusion. I liked the, that the files were scanned and uploaded to Teams. I loved the little magnify feature on Teams. So, you know, I could zoom in, I could turn up the brightness on my computer to read everything better. And I love that I could do it on my own time. And Marion also gave us a document that had very detailed instructions and broke everything up into sections, which was very helpful 
because during the semester, it was shorter than it usually is, and I had more work to do than ever before. So being able to break this up and have the instructions right there and do it on my own time was very helpful, and it was not as stressful for me as other experiences were during that semester. Next slide, please. So taking her class was also a valuable experience. I mean, it would have been great to be there in person and seeing in person a lot of the cool things that she was gonna bring in. And also you definitely form more of a bond with people when you see them face to face. So I did miss that element, but I also enjoyed the online elements. There's, there's benefits to both. And I do like high flex because I think it balances both. And I feel that I can translate what I learned virtually to real archival materials. And I also feel like I got monetary value out of class. When we left for the COVID lockdown, the end of that first semester, a lot of my classes just like stopped. Um, we, I had one class that continued doing virtual sessions and then the rest just kind of stopped. It was like, here's the rest of your work, read it on your own, or here's a recording. And I know myself and a lot of other students didn't like that because we really didn't feel like we were getting our money's worth um, or you know, learning the way that we should be learning, getting the value out of that. I also feel that my experiences led me to being a more confident student assistant because I've learned a lot more and it's also definitely increased my desire to work in an archive. And Marion's class was definitely successful. And this is a picture of me after I had finished my first two boxes of nine and 10 after nine months of working with them. Next slide, please. So here is my contact information and thank you so much for listening to my presentation. So um, I just want to point out, we only have about four minutes left of time. So I didn't know, Megan, if you had slides to present as well, or if you wanted to open it up to q and I'll leave that up to you. Oh, no, we can open it up to Q&A. So if people have questions, um, you can um, throw them in the Q&A box. I haven't seen any pop in. Um, I haven't seen anything coming in the chat as well, but um, I did want to give people a chance to ask some questions um, or at, at least leave it up to you guys to decide if you wanted to do questions or if you wanted to um, take the last four minutes to do a little presenting. So, um, No, I figured we could open up for questions if there's any from participants. or if other panelists want to ask each other questions. Unfortunately, the questions that I had prepared, um, everyone kind of answered them as they were going along. So um, that foiled my plans. I have something from Heather um, from UW Stout. Um, what COVID related adaptations do you hope to maintain in the future? And Heather, was that for everybody or was that just for someone specifically? Anyone? Thanks. Hi, this is Marion. I'll just jump in and say that I don't see at my university that hybrid or online classes are going to go away or digital internships. Um, and I'm, and um, I think that I really enjoy rotating and being at home as well. Um, so I'm hoping all of those will continue. Yeah, I definitely second what Marion said. I would love to see HyFlex continue. I think that it's a very valuable tool and for some people that's the way that they learn best, but I understand that for everybody it's different. So I love that that is an option and I hope that it will continue. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're right at time. So um, don't forget, I know that probably there were more questions, um, but I know that we can contact um, the people in our group. They put their emails in their presentations as well. Um, don't forget to check out our virtual posters and tours during your downtime. Um, we also want your feedback. So please take a few minutes to complete our MAC 2021 survey when it arrive, arrives um, via email next week. 
So um, thank you all so much for attending and um, we'll see you soon. Take it easy.